Lung cancer is predominantly a disease of people who live in large cities or in industrial areas, whereas people who live in rural communities have a much lower incidence of lung cancer. There are substances in the air in every city in the United States, and I suspect in every city in the world, which are known to produce cancer. Lung cancer has been found to be increasing among ducks at the Philadelphia Zoo, located in a typical city air pollution area. It seems to us possible that they were ingesting material that was deposited in this, in this mud, and that excretion by way of the lungs is, is, a, is a possible exit of the carcinogens that are taken in through the mouth. The other possibility is that they are inhaling it. Not long ago, an outdoor-dwelling Siberian tiger died in the Philadelphia Zoo. Cause of death, as determined by autopsy, cancer of the lung. Others point out additional factors statistically associated with lung cancer. This disease is a male disease. Women do get the disease, it is true, but they do not get it in the same, uh, with the same frequency uh, as the male. The actual number of cases of lung cancer, although recognizable and significant, is not terribly, terribly large, whereas the number of people who smoke cigarettes is extremely large. And any theory which explains why A causes B also has to explain why A does not cause B in the people in whom it does not occur. And this is the one thing which these people have not explained. Uh, it's an incomplete theory. The U.S. Surgeon General's report, which dealt with smoking back in the 60s, specifically stated that statistical methods cannot establish proof of a causal relationship in an association. Smoking, of course, has been associated statistically with other health problems. One of them is coronary illness. We found that there were more than twice as many uh, smokers that died of heart disease as non-smokers. Some headlines reflect the smoking adversary view that there is a cause and effect relationship between smoking and health. But conclusions based on simple statistics do not satisfy many. They feel that more meaningful research should focus on the smoker rather than the smoke. Do smokers differ from non-smokers? Smokers tend to be more aggressive, outgoing, extroverted people, uh, hard-driving, full of tension. Uh, they tend to marry more often, divorce more often, move their houses more often, change their occupations more often than do uh, non-smokers. As our society accelerates at an increasingly faster pace and grows more complicated, we are forced to seek true answers based not on statistical coincidence, but on meaningful research into causes. We still live in an era of environmental determinism. That's to say, uh, we have an essentially, essentially optimistic philosophy. We want to believe that all our ills can be attributed to something in the environment. It means that all we have to do is to eliminate smoking, eliminate soft water, and so on, and we will eliminate lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, and so on. I think we have a great deal to learn, and I think far too many people have rushed to a premature judgment based upon very inadequate evidence, uh, chiefly because of the tremendous emotional need to oversimplify and to make things easy and palatable for uh, the public, for medical students, as well as for legislators. The tobacco industry is concerned about the implications for its products. It believes informed discussion is essential to the public interest. Its dollar commitment to independent scientific research in the area of smoking and health exceeds the combined support of the Cancer Society and the Heart and Lung Associations and is growing yearly as we seek the answers that we need. The biggest thing we need is a good idea. We need more good ideas and we need more good quality research.
Western world is on a quest for purity. We want our spring water sealed in bottles, the fruits of our earth organic, our fats polyunsaturated, our diets low cholesterol. And pollution, more today than ever before, is most certainly a dirty word. And this quest for purity is an excellent one, just so long as it's informed by reason. For reason tells us, as science does, that absolute purity does not exist. Our water would be undrinkable if it really were pure H2O, with none of the salts we're used to. Our plant life would wither and die without carbon dioxide in the air. What we perceive as pollution is usually due to unacceptable levels of a substance, not to the mere fact of its presence. Of course, we ourselves change the composition of the air we breathe, and not always for the better. And we always did, long before we invented the motor car, or the chemical plant, or the blast furnace. Curiously, when you consider the discomfort they can cause, the vast majority of the substances in indoor air are both invisible and odorless. Perhaps that's why the occasional components which can be seen or smelt attract extra attention. The occupants of a building are most apt to incriminate tobacco smoke as the cause of the symptoms that they're uh, experiencing. Att uh, tobaksröken har kommit att framstå som kanske för vissa människor den mest betydelsefulla det är ju just att man kan både se och lukta tobaksrök medan till exempel radon varken är synlig eller luktar någonting. Eh, om man däremot eh, ser på de undersökning, vetenskapliga undersökningar som har gjorts över vilka luftföreningar som finns så finner man att eh, det är i relativt få fall som eh, tobaksrök anses vara huvudorsaken till en dålig luft. It is possible that uh, under conditions of very poor ventilation that the irritation that is caused uh, could enhance people's symptoms, particularly if they had a respiratory uh, infection. Uh, uh, but uh, this can easily be solved by proper ventilation. NIOSH found that in the 203 investigations they reported upon that only four or two percent of the cases uh, was there a major uh, impact of the environmental tobacco smoke in terms of the symptoms of the occupants? Only 2%, as against 10.3% for contamination from outside, for example, and a massive 48.3% of cases, nearly half the total, in which inadequate ventilation was identified as the culprit. But since contamination from inside is also quite a considerable factor, what about those other substances, from carpets, furnishings, copiers, or whatever? What effects do they have on people? Generally speaking, the kind of things people are talking about in terms of the sick building syndrome are symptoms of irritancy. They're not life-threatening in themselves. They are simply signs that something in the way people are working, be it a contaminant, be it a microbial bacteria, be it some dust, whatever it happens to be, is causing what people would consider to be discomfort. The consensus certainly seems to be that while the sources of air pollution in a sealed building can be numerous and complex, its root cause lies virtually always in poor ventilation. Put right the ventilation then, and the problem will normally be solved. Perfect purity, alas, lives only within the borders of utopia. In the real world, We've been affecting our air ever since Adam and Eve shed their first skin scales. But today, with so many of us spending less than 10% of our lives in the great outdoors, it's all the more important that our indoor air is at least adequate for comfort and well-being. And indeed it can be, if we only see to it that our ventilation systems are used and maintained as their designers intended.